and uh, that was beautiful. That was that was absolutely beautiful. Uh, thank you. I didn't want to say I almost felt like I was on the Titanic. That probably wouldn't be a, a really good thing to say, but uh, thank you so much for that. Uh, that was that was really good. You know, I um, pre pre these days. Uh, I know it's hard for some of you to understand what that means, but the world did exist before this existed. And, uh, and there was a, uh, a friend of mine who had a poster that he hung in his, in his uh, space. And uh, the poster went like this, two things. There is a God, and I'm not him. And I thought, well, that's, that pretty much summarizes everything. If there's anything we need to know about life, it is those two things. There is a God, and I'm not him. And oh, by that, by way that, by inference, that means you're not him either. And it's just a reminder uh, as we as we dive into God's Word this morning, because I found it fascinating as I was going back and reading about the dedication of Solomon's Temple. And Solomon's Temple is obviously a, an amazing place. Uh, there are there are still remains of Solomon's Temple that exist today. Uh, and when uh, I did one of my quarters in my, or actually it was just, when I was quarter back then uh, of my master's degree, I did it there in Jerusalem and studied there for five months. And it was absolutely awesome. There is nothing like going to what we now know as the Wailing Wall uh, on Shabbat as they blow the horn and everybody comes together to be at the Wailing Wall, uh, which is actually believed to be one of the remnants of Solomon's Temple. And uh, it is amazing because when you go there, you see how magnificently ginormous those rocks, I mean, to call them rocks is really the wrong thing because they're so ginormous and how did they move them and everything else? And so having been there and having seen that, uh, having spent much time there and seeing it, and then thinking about today and thinking about this, this opportunity to be here on this day of dedication, a day of baptisms, uh, etc., I am struck by Solomon because Solomon is considered to be the wisest man ever to live. Although with the number of wives and everything he had, I'm not sure how far his wisdom went. But I'll just... He is pretty much represented and believed in Scripture to be the wisest man to ever live. And he wrote, I mean, he, he, when he did his prayer about, this, about dedicating this magnificent building and praying over this magnificent building, he sticks a little line in there, a couple lines in there, that I thought were kind of, to use the word uh, that was used in Sabbath school today, ironic. And here's what he said. In the prior chapter from our verse today, chapter 6 of 2 Chronicles, verse 18. 2 Chronicles, chapter 6, verse 18. I love it. He, uh, he begins, in the middle of this prayer, he begins with this question. But will God really dwell on earth with humans? So let's just stop there for a moment. Because ah, we look at it today, thousands of years later, and said, of course, of course God dwells. But in the mind of those of the day of Solomon and those around him with all the multi, the poly gods that existed throughout that whole time, there was a widespread belief. And even when you get later in the, in the history, in the time of history, moving through, and you get, by the time you get to the Greeks and then you get to the Romans, many... Philosophers even believed with the reality that there were gods, but they would never in any shape or form ever come to earth. And so even for the time of Solomon and even hundreds of years later, in the time of the Greeks and the time of the Romans, which ends up being the time of Jesus, for God to come to earth or even to, quote, dwell on earth was a rather foreign concept. A very foreign concept. And so for him to raise that question in this prayer, he's tapping into how people believe in that time frame. 
that even in his prayer he could understand that when I am speaking to this divine being, this God of the universe, this Yahweh who has made a sacred covenant with his people, that when I speak to that, I, I am recognizing that there are those around and perhaps even in our midst who might even have the question, why would we build such an extravagant thing if God doesn't come to humanity? And so he asked the question that may be in the minds of some. Will God really dwell on earth with humans? And then he asks, then he goes and makes a response to that that is quite obvious, but he makes it, and it's the focus of my of the message for today. The heavens, even the highest heavens, cannot contain you. And then he says, well, and I'm going to put in a general, a wider context. He is arguing from the largest, the biggest, to the smallest, because he said, even the highest heavens can't contain you, then man, how in the world is this temple that I have built going to contain you? Solomon was not under any illusion to believe that what he was building was going to contain God. So let me just start for there for a moment. Stop there for a moment. Let us never come to believe that God can be tamed, contained within the building of all nations church. Right? Let us never come to believe, dare I say it, that God can be not be contained within the structure or within the framework of the Seventh-day Adventist church. It has its purpose, just like the building has its purpose, but God is never fully contained, because if God is fully contained anywhere, why do we need eternity? God cannot be contained. Solomon, I mean, I, I have no idea. You know, you see paintings and drawings and everything else about that temple, and he recognized, even looking at the glory of that temple, which probably none of us could fathom, and when you look at the 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 the, uh, the the detail of that temple, I mean, using gold plated to plate the walls, and all of this, and the and the the beauty of the uh, of the linens that they used, etc. If you looked at all of it, it would be eye captivating, which tells me something about God, does it not? God doesn't just want our junk. Now, will he take it? Of course, because if that's all you got, that's all you got. He doesn't want something from you that you don't have. He, but he wanted for his people to utilize the best and to create the best, because dare I say, by God creating that temple, he wanted everyone to know that he understands the power of how the eye is attracted to beauty. And if the eye is attracted to beauty, then we might want to pay more attention to beauty. And so let me stop there for a moment because God has a thousand ways by which to capture our attention. It doesn't just have to be the destruction of a bush that didn't destroy, otherwise known as the burning bush. I mean, I don't know about you, but if a bush is burning and it ain't burning, you got my attention. Um, if a hand comes out from nowhere and starts writing on a wall, you got my attention. I don't care if I'm drunk, which is what happened in Daniel's time. But God also, don't forget this, God can also use beauty to bring us to himself. This is why as the colors begin to change and we begin to begin to see Oh, do I, do I have to say a word about that after just having experienced the Chicagoland Convocation last weekend and seeing as we all, not all, many of our uh, countries that were represented carried their flags in because there is beauty in diversity. We were created for diversity. If we weren't, we wouldn't see the fall colors. And... Those fall colors, I mean, people pay lots of money to go see fall colors. Not me, of course, but many people do. They love to go. They'll take up, they'll go up to New England if they want to see them in the United States by far. They'll go up to New England. I have yet to do it. 
because all I hear about is traffic. I live in Chicago. I don't need traffic. But here's what I want you to hear, is that in this moment, Solomon recognizes the power of beauty that it draws people, God re because God recognized it and organized it that way, so that when people saw the, the beauty of the temple, they would be see beyond the beauty of the temple to see the one who is the creator. And I am reminding you that the beauty of the creator is still at work today. And we should not worship the beauty we should worship the creator. If we worship the beauty and miss the creator, we've missed the whole deal. And so I am thankful, but also, going back to Solomon's words here, he recognized that that beauty couldn't contain God. So even the reality, and this is why, this is why I love this passage, because he realizes that even to that group of people, even to the language that he was using in his prayer, he recognized in that dedication that they could fall, fall now pay attention, he could fall, fall, they could fall in love more with the temple than with God because of its beauty. And dare I say, we could fall more in love with the beauty of our message than with the God who is at the core of the message. And the danger is to fall more in love with the message itself and miss the person that it's about. Just like it was for them in this day. You can see this beauty. You can have it. You can look at it. You can know God has established his place here. But do not forget, it is not about this place. It is about God. Because ultimately, as we know later on, when, uh, especially when Haggai would come along and say that this place, the new one, because Solomon's temple gets largely destroyed, not totally, but largely, and then there's a new temple that's built. And remember what happened when the new temple got built? Anybody remember what happened? An amazing moment. When the new temple was finished, one of the writers describes it this way. He said that, when they were there and they were together, there was the sounds of weeping and the sounds of joy inter intermingled. Do you know why? Because those who were there who remember Solomon's temple were depressed and started crying about the fact that this new temple, oh, dare I say it, was not as good as the old temple. Now, see, if they had been at a board meeting, they would have said something like, man, I remember the good old days when we had that temple. <laughs> we just need to get back to the good old days. And so they started weeping because the reality was that what had replaced Solomon's temple was not nearly as beautiful as Solomon's temple. Well, maybe there was a reason why. Because maybe God realized that you had fallen in love with the temple, but not with me. So maybe I need to cut down you know, di uh, diminish the beauty of the temple so you would not forget me. And so they did that. And so he did, they, they did that in that moment. But here's the thing is that Solomon, by praying this prayer, I, I just, I can imagine some people in the audience, Solomon, why are you dissing the temple, man? I mean, why are you saying that God can't be contained in the temple when we're here to celebrate this thing? Because Solomon knew and realized by the power of the Holy Spirit and by the leading of their God, Solomon realized that they would end up in a place, as he goes on to say later even in the prayer, they would end up in a place where they would no longer see God and all they would see is the temple. And brothers and sisters, even for those of us who claim Jesus, it's easier that we love the gifts of Jesus but not the giver. So I will tell you, appropriately love this building, but don't worship it. Appropriately love this land, but don't worship it. Because dare I say, I'm leaving, so you know, you can get mad at Pastor Jose on my behalf, you know. <laughs> dare I say that when it's all said and done, I know this is going to sound really bad, but the building's going to burn. 
the building is ultimately going to burn. Now, nobody please do that early. Okay? But it's ultimately going to burn. And here's the thing. is because it's ultimately going to burn, it doesn't matter in the ultimate sense. The only thing that matters is each of you sitting in this room today. Because each of you, while this burn, building may burn, because you have selected Jesus, you have given your life to Jesus, you walk with Jesus, you are going to continue long past this building. Amen. Because eternity and salvation is not about a building, it's about you, and it's about I. And so just be reminded as Solomon, you know, kind of sticks that into the middle of his prayer to remind them, you know, we are doing something significant here, folks, but remember that God can't be contained in this building. So don't ever come to the place of believing that what you see here is the totality of everything that's going to be in the universe. Because you can't take the universe and shrink wrap it into a single little room called the most holy place where very few people got to go actually pretty much nobody got to go it was all remember the temple was created the sanctuary the temple was created to help lead people to jesus that's why when jesus came because what does it say the word became flesh and did what dwelt and you know what that word is in the in the Greek it is the same word in the Greek that is used back in Ezekiel I mean sorry in Exodus 40 it is the exact same word that is used for the temple for the sanctuary so that's why you'll find some translations will say uh, and I love when they say it the word became flesh and tabernacled among us because it is the same word in Greek there and Greek in the Septuagint the Greek version of the Old Testament that is used there so that the reader who saw that would realize that John using that language is triggering them back to that Exodus chapter 40 so that they realize that Jesus is the fulfillment of that. Because the beauty of God and the beauty of Jesus cannot be contained in a temple. And so, brothers and sisters, my prayer for each of us, <clears throat> as you continue your venture into this place, as you continue the journey together, is that you realize that the building was given not as a means of capturing God, but actually as a means of revealing God. And that what even reveals God more is not the building, but dare I say, the people. And this is why it is so powerful and so important. I would rather see beautiful people than a beautiful building. And that's God's intention. Because the reality is, when we get to heaven, I have no idea what's going to go on. But I know I've already made a deal with God. I don't know if he's going to, you know, if it's a good deal or not. So I'll wait for eternity to find out. I don't need a building. Just give me a planet. Okay? And because I, I am an introvert, give me a planet where nobody else is. <laughs> so when I need a people break, I can go to my planet. And then God, you know, I'm always, and, and we have no idea what eternity will be like. But I can say that eternity will be so much bigger than a temple, than a building, than a property. It will be so much grander that we won't even remember this because that will be so big. A really bad moment here. So let me share this. Some of you are going to think it's heresy. That's okay. I still love you. I can rarely, I grew up in the north side of Chicago. Okay. I grew up two miles from Wrigley Field. So I used to go to Cubs games all the time. I don't remember any of the pain of being a Cubs fan because 2016 came along. Okay? Because the joy of 2016 erased 108 years of pain. 
Okay? Brothers and sisters, the joy of being in the presence of God will erase all the pain that we have suffered on this earth. This is why this is why Paul wrote our sufferings are nothing. This is why a very popular Christian author took Paul's words and I love the title of his sermon, The Weight of Glory. Because the weight of glory is heavier than the weight of suffering. We suffer now, but when we get into eternity, that suffering will be weightless compared to the weight of God's glory. And the, and, and the beauty of that temple, that weight of that temple, those magnificent, I don't know, I call them rocks, whatever you want to call them, they're ginormous. I mean, they're beautifully cut and everything sculpted out. That weight is nothing compared to the weight of eternity with the one that we love. So brothers and sisters, let us be encouraged, not merely by the beauty of a building or being having the opportunity to be here in a building, but let us be encouraged by the reality that we get to experience the glory of God for eternity. As the old song used to say, face to face with Christ my Savior. Amen. Amen.